Well, good morning. This is Dr. Delahousse, uh doing a videotape substitute lecture for MAE 3323 uh, fall 11 semester for Dr. Hatami Morbini's class. Uh, I was scheduled to do this lecture live in class this morning, but I had a slight emergency come up, but that's not the real reason. I just plum forgot. So I apologize for uh, having you come to a very early class and getting nothing out of it. Uh, this video lecture will be the substitute, and I will see you Wednesday in class time at 8.30. Um, you have been talking uh, about Chapter 5, which is failures re resulting from static loading, which is basically one-time loading that might cause fa failure of the part. And so you have uh, been looking at the various failure theories, and I think maybe you completed the failure theories for static loading of ductile materials. Um, and so those static loading for duct ductile materials failures were basically a maximum shear stress theory, a distortion energy theory, and a Coulomb Moore theory. Uh, just to remind you a bit on where these theories came from, let's see, I've got a chapter four handy somewhere just to remind you of the Moore circle. Actually, it was chapter three where we first learned about these Cartesian stress components and how stress at a, t at a point is represented by a uh, tensor of various stresses acting on the faces that have relationships, and then got into the idea of plane stress, and which represents an awful lot of what we do as a mechanical engineer, but not everything. Okay, and from plane stress, we came to the idea of a Moore circle. Okay. And one of the ideas that we developed in the idea of Moore's circle is a maximum principal stress from plane stress, or, which is a normal stress, a minimum normal stress, or stress in the other direction, and a maximum shear stress occurring in the part. And from that point on, we did talk about, about the only failure theory that we had handy was a maximum shear stress theory of failure that said a part failed whenever the maximum shear stress in the part reach the same level as the maximum shear stress as the part in, did in a tensile test. And of course the tensile test would have this point placed at the origin and our uh, maximum load, our circle uh, maximum uh, shear stress would in fact be the yield stress divided by two. We saw that. But also moving forward in chapter three, we move from the plane stress problem to the idea that we also have three-dimensional Moore circles uh, this one shows a fully three-dimensional Moore circle. Uh, and we, I don't have a great picture of it, but we eventually went to the idea that even a two-dimensional Moore circle, as this one is, will have two other circles that we have to be considerate of. Okay, One is, and those two other circles, uh, some of them involve the origin. If I have both points on my original data to the right of the origin, then my Moore circle may not cross the origin. Then I need to draw a tiny Moore circle between here and the origin. And I need to draw an extremely large Moore circle between here and the origin. Okay, it's the largest radius Moore circle that will always concern us because that largest radius Moore circle will have the, la the largest shear stress. Okay, and that's where we come to when we're talking about a maximum shear stress theory of failure which we are in chapter four, that's where we come to the idea of an if statement. If both of my principal stresses computed from plane stress are positive, then my biggest shear stress circle is only determined by this rightmost point. If my two points cross the zero axis, then my biggest, then my, uh, the radius of my Moore circle, which is the maximum shear stress, depends on both points when they cross the axis. Uh, because yeah, this one will be the biggest Moore circle. If both points are on the other side of the axis, then only the leftmost point would be used in determining the maximum shear stress because that leftmost point combined with the zero would produce the biggest circle, and that wouldn't be the circle we would normally draw. So that's the origin of the if statements in the maximum shear stress theory. Let's set this aside for a little while and then move into the chapter. And again, this is just quick review. I suspect that he showed you some machine parts that had failed in various ways. Okay, I think this paragraph from the textbook really is worth reading. Uh, there's an earlier section that said basically there are lots of classes 
where we're worried about failure. Okay, and in some of those classes, we need to do testing, an elaborate amount of testing, to understand not only the manufacturing process, processes of our part and what ends up getting produced, but we also need to understand the raw materials that are coming to us. And they may not have the materials that are properties that are typically published in a textbook or uh, even promised to us by the manufacturer. We need to go through materials testing of raw materials and we need to go through testing of our parts. Sometimes we can't. That's what this thing says. More often than not, it's necessary to design using only the published values of yield strength, ultimate strength, percent reduction in area, and percent elongation. If that's the case, if we're forced to design in that environment, we ha must somehow be able to infer failure from that meager amount of data. And we need to ensure failure against both static and dynamic loading, 2D and 3D stresses, high and low temperature, large, part, large number of parts, small number of parts. How on earth can we do that which, with such small amounts of data? <clears throat> well, we are going to be able to infer failure from things like yield strength, ultimate strength, but in great uncertainties we're going to be applying factors of safeties and we'll still do our best job in inferring failure or not. <clears throat> You've passed through the idea of stress concentrations in an earlier chapter. The three failure theories that you've already covered for ductile materials is a maximum shear stress, which I've just sort of briefly mentioned, the distortion energy theory, and then the ductile coulomb more theory when we have ductile materials that have uh, tensile stresses that are different than their compressive stresses. And then you have not yet covered brittle materials, and so we'll be talking about brittle materials today. But for the moment, let's pass through ductile materials, and you'll notice in your textbook that you will have a set of cases or if statements. <clears throat> Case one says if our principal stresses A and B uh, computed from our uh, stress state which would include normal stresses in two directions and a shear stress, but if our principal stresses are both positive, okay, then that takes us to a case where uh, what we saw back here, I'll drag this back in, both principal stresses are positive. The circle we would ordinarily draw does not cross the zero axis, therefore we have to mentally draw two other circles, the tiny one between here and the origin that's irrelevant, but then we have the large circle that's based on sigma 1, which is our sigma A, and it'll be a circle with a greater radius passing through the origin, and in this case, that large circle determines our failure boundary because maximum shear stress occurs on that circle, not the simple circle we would ordinarily draw. So only our rightmost stress factors in. What does this if statement say? It says if they're both positive, then sigma A is determinant, and if our sigma A is greater than our yield strength as reported in a tensile test, then we will fail if this is bigger than that. They have not yet in these equations introduced the idea of factor of safety. Later on you will see them dividing by n the factor of safety. I would suggest you probably go ahead and modify your textbooks to say when sigma a is greater than or equal to our yield strength divided by n, that's when we fail. <clears throat> Case 2 says sigma A is positive and sigma B is negative. Looking back at our Mohr circle, if this is a positive number and this is a negative number, that means the origin is somewhere in between those two points, maybe here, which means I need to draw a circle, if my origin were here, a smallish circle, sort of like that, and I need to draw a biggish circle to the other point. But in any case, the Mohr circle I would ordinarily draw for plain stress is in fact the longest circle. And so the radius of this circle, which is shown right here on the Mohr circle picture, the radius of the circle certainly depends on sigma A and sigma B, both of them when we cross the origin. So we expect when we look at our case two, that if sigma A is positive and sigma B is negative, then 
sigma A and sigma B both play a role in determining failure, and in fact it's the difference between sigma A and sigma B being compared to the yield strength, again I would say divided by the factor of safety. Finally, if they're both negative, then my origin is over here somewhere, and my plane stress circle does not cross the origin, then I have to worry about that largest circle which goes through the origin and through the leftmost point. And only that largest circle is determinant for our maximum shear stress. None of the smaller circles matter. And in that case, then only the leftmost point is determinant in failure. This says if they're both compressive and sigma B is the most compressive stress, then our sigma B being more compressive, meaning to the left of our negative yield, which would be our compressive yield, okay, or we again would divide by the factor of safety. So that's a quick summary of these three cases. Um, Dr. Hatami had said that you preferred to go back to the Moore circle diagram in all cases to think this through. I don't have any objection to that other than, and I think it's fine, I think you need to do that for a while. But at some point, I think, once you've done it enough, you can learn to trust these equations and use them. And these equations, as presented, will save you a lot of time. And so I would encourage you to simply trust, eventually trust these cases, look at the magnitudes uh, and signs of your principal stresses, and then choose one of these very easy formulas for determining whether you fail or not, and choose the appropriate one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, moving on. Oh, another way of viewing this failure is to view this in, for, again, for plain stress problems, is to view this in a different set of coordinates. This is not more circle coordinates. Here we have our sigma A, max normal stress, being plotted. Here's sigma B plotted on a different axis. If you think carefully about this, where failure lies, as long as whatever my sigma A's and B's are, as long as they're both positive, which means they're within this box, as long as they're both positive and neither one of them crosses this right-hand axis. And sigma A, by definition, is the larger of the two positive ones. So as long as our sigma A doesn't cross this right-hand axis, I'm safe. If they're both negative, then that means the sigma A and sigma B exist together in this box somewhere or at least in this right, this lower quadrant. And if they are in fact within the box, based on sigma B not heading too far to the left, then we're safe. Now again, we might want to divide by factor of safety before we draw this graph, okay? So these three failure boundaries come from both positive, both negative, and A being positive, B being negative, and both of them have influence on failure. This failure diagram can be used if we will plot our current stress state. If we plot points in here for sigma A and sigma B, we're safe. If our point plots down here for sigma A and B, we're safe. If it plots out here, we're not safe. And if it plots there, we're not safe, etc. So you get the idea of this kind of a diagram for safety. Later on, we're not going to have a point to plot because we don't really know what our stress point is because we're in the middle of a design problem. But we may actually be able to plot a line that says our stress state may exist anywhere on the line, and then I may want to uh, decide how to uh, tailor the stress state to just barely reach failure. You talked about the distortion energy theory that says any given stress state, could be co especially at the principal stress state level, can be po composed of an average stress state. These are all different. Take the average of these three stresses, put it here, and then add in the differences. This average stress state, the theory is, it's called the hydrostatic component, actually does not lead to failure, okay? We can either compress or stretch this thing as long as we don't put any kind of shape distortion into it. As long as we keep the same shape, it appears we can compress or stretch this thing to uh, radically different sizes, but it's only the shape changing components or the distortional components that cause failure. And what we're going to do is we're going to compute the total energy of the body due to the stress state. Then we're going to subtract out the hydrostatic component energies. 
and what we'll have left is the energies from the distortional components and we will then infer something about failure from those. That's the distortion energy theory, okay, or also known as the von Mises Hinkle theory. <clears throat> I'm going to skip the derivation, of course. You've already been that through that. What's interesting about the final result is that if we look at the failure uh, diagram that we saw earlier for maximum shear stress, you can see the straight lines of the maximum shear stress failure theory. Notice that the distortion energy theory has similar shape, but is rounded. It's a nonlinear equation. But notice it's not terribly far away from the maximum shear stress theory, but it is a little bit larger. <clears throat> so the distortion energy theory is actually a little more generous in what it allows us to do with our materials before it asks us to decide that they have failed. The maximum uh, distortion energy theory right here says this point on the graph succeeds, where the maximum shear stress theory would say, no, this point on the graph is a failure, that failure has already occurred. So you've seen the equations of distortion energy, you've seen examples of distortion energy, and let's see, and what's nice about distortion energy is there are no cases. It's just one big continuous smooth curve. And that really is incredibly nice that there's no if statement to deal with on the distortion energy cases. Now, in just a moment, the book is going to start referring to something called the load line. Okay? And these are going to be valuable in Chapter 5, and they're going to be incredibly valuable in Chapter 6 when we start looking at the fatigue diagrams. Okay, what is a load line? A load line says I have a structure, and... I really don't know what load I can apply, what force I can apply to the structure, or what set of forces I can apply to the structure. But I do know that if I were to try different forces, my stress point would move along a certain line. Okay, And if all my forces go to zero, most of my load lines converge to the center of this thing, which is sigma A equals zero and sigma B equals zero. There are other kinds of load lines where the loads that I'm worrying about go away but we don't actually have stresses terminating at zero for some of those load lines. We'll see that in the design of bolts when we're talking about fatigue later. But the vast majority of load lines in this chapter and even in the fatigue chapter will pass through the zero. So this thing basically says if the forces that I plan to apply to my part start at zero and start growing, my stress state will follow this line or my stress state will follow this line or my stress state will follow that line. What's really nice about the load lines um, and understanding load lines and operating points is understanding that the intersection between my load line and the failure boundary of the diagram gives me an indication of how uh, of the worst thing I can do to this part and still expect it to barely survive. And then it allows me to draw conclusions on factors of safety if I'm wanting to calculate a factor of safety. This point is approximately two-thirds, let's see, actually this point, yeah, is approximately two-thirds of the way between zero and the failure point. Okay, and so given that, I would say the factor of safety, this one, I can estimate as... How long is this one? This is, let's say this is a length of one. How long is this one? That's a length of two-thirds. The ratio of the long line to the short line tells me what my factor of safety is. So I would estimate that uh, this point right here is at a factor of safety of about one and a half. What does it mean? Here's my operating point. Here is about half of my operating point distance. I've got an excess here, excess capacity, that's equal to about half my distance of the point back to the origin. So a, dist a ratio of one to a ratio of about two-thirds gives me a one and a half factor of safety. To my eye, this distance looks bigger than half of this distance. Okay, I would say I have a factor of safety of a little less than two on this one. This one, I'd ha say I have a factor of safety of somewhere around 0.8 or something, or, or sorry, 1 over 0.8. So maybe a factor of safety of about a 1.2, 1.3, or like 1.2 though. So load lines, 
operating points and failure boundaries can be used very nicely as a picture to talk about factors of safeties and that'll be very important again in the fatigue chapter. Finally, you've already covered the Coulomb-Moore theory for ductile materials and for ductile materials when we have different strengths in tension and compression our Coulomb-Moore theory is very nice. I'm going to skip some of the development. You've already seen it. There are in fact three cases for this theory. This theory looks like this when we plot it in our Sigma A, Sigma B failure picture and what we can see quite clearly on the diagram is this square region if we're in pure tension the same square region if we're in co pure compression but typically our compressive yield stresses are much higher than our tensile yield stresses so this is a much bigger box and then our blending lines are no longer at an angle of 45 degrees they're at whatever angle it takes to bring the box together this represents our failure region obviously if our stresses A and B are both positive we have a failure format which is pretty much identical to the maximum shear stress theory. If both of our uh, stresses, principal stresses are compressive then we again have a maximum shear stress theory of failure but we're using the compressive number rather than the tensile stress number. If we're in between where one is positive one is negative then our Moore circle will require blending given that we're in between and that blending comes from this equation right here. So both positive, only one stress is of significance. Both negative, only one stress is of significance. Blended together, both stresses are, and both strengths are of significance. Again, we have not yet put in factor of, sa factor of safety to these equations, so I would put a divided by n here and I would put a divide by n here and I would put a divide by n here to say that failure with our considered factor of safety would be governed by sigma a being when we fail when sigma a is bigger than our tensile stress divided by factor of safety. Okay, uh, you've seen all of these, you've worked a pro example problem with all of these. This is the summary uh, of theories for, uh, this is a comparison of the two theories productive materials with data. You've seen this. You see how the maximum shear stress is very conservative. I don't see any points that are truly inside the maximum shear stress theory. We see that the uh, distortion energy theory is a pretty good fit. It seems to be a, a pretty good mathematical fitting of the data to, re to of the equation to reality but there are some points of failure that lie outside. There are some points of failure that lie inside. They don't always lie right on the boundary. And so if you want to be ultra conservative, you might use the maximum shear stress theory. If you're going to be using a factor of safety to account for some of these outliers, okay, in particular a failure point that maximum uh, distortion energy says didn't fail or wouldn't fail, okay that's not conservative that's a little bit unsafe then we'll use factors of safety to account for that I will tell you that the distortion energy of von Mises Hinkle theory is incredibly popular it is embedded into lots and lots of design programs structural analysis programs and primarily because it is so easy to use it's, it's an equation that doesn't have any if statements which makes it very easy to use You've already seen these examples, and so finally what we're going to do is jump to brittle materials, okay? And so in jumping over to brittle, theory, brittle materials, we'll first start off with a maximum normal stress theory that simply says whatever our maximum normal stress is, uh, whether we exceed the tensile stress with our sigma 1 or exceed our compressive stress with... Uh, sigma 3 either of those causes failure okay the maximum normal stress theory of failure with the sigma a sigma b diagram would look like this again we see potential load lines 
Okay, notice one big change when we go from our uh, ductile materials to brittle materials. That is our axes, our limits involve ultimate tensile strengths, ultimate compressive strengths, not yield. Okay, we're not going to have a nice yield warning for these brittle materials. Okay, and again, the idea of load lines will be coming up again. If we look at data for brittle materials, what we're going to see is that the maximum, norm, maximum normal stress actually is not very good and actually is dangerous. Okay, here is multiple sets of data plotted on the sigma A, sigma B axes. The big square is our maximum normal stress and look at the significant number of failures that are occurring within what this theory would call the safety region. Okay, so we're going to throw out the possibility of the maximum normal stress. We are not going to use it. Okay, uh, and then we're going to turn to, and you can already see them on the picture, we're going to turn to a theory called the modified Moore theory, and then we're going to turn to a theory called the uh, brittle Coulomb Moore theory. And we've already encountered the Coulomb Moore theory for ductile materials, and it simply said draw a line, first of all, draw this square, draw the all negative square, and then connect the two squares with a line from corner to corner. So if we were to scroll back, you would see a square, a square, and two lines connecting those corners, looking identical to the Coulomb Moore theory. And the only difference is we will be using this when we use brittle materials as opposed to ductile materials. Now, looking at this brittle Coulomb Moore theory, notice this dotted line, and notice these real failure points. Okay. I've got significant amounts of failure in a region where Coulomb Moore says, uh, you know, I should fail here. I should not have lived all the way to here. Okay, so really, brittle Coulomb Moore is quite conservative. It predicts failure earlier than reality in some cases. Now, here is not conservative. And within this positive, positive region, we actually have failures inside all of our theories, which means we better be using appropriate factors of safety if we're going to be using these theories. But at least in the positive, negative region, where sigma A is positive, sigma B is negative, in that region, the brittle Coulomb Moore is ultra conservative. I have significant ba uh, failure points way outside of this boundary. Which then leads to another idea for uh, the brittle failure. Notice how these points tend to hang on this vertical line for a while and then start to curve away and head back to this point right here. What we could do, and I think it's stated that way in my notes and in the textbook, we could actually come up with a nice smooth curve just like the distortion energy curve, maybe even similar to the distortion energy curve, we might be able to come up with a nice smooth curve that captured this data and captured the true behavior of the materials. Problem is that curve would be a nonlinear curve and we're still going to have if statements because we wouldn't use that curve in this region and we would use it down here. So the alternative that we are in fact going to use is let's admit that these points do follow the straight line down even into the compressive region. Okay, but here they turn away from the straight line of the maximum normal stress theory, but they still lie way outside of the Coulomb Moore theory. Let's just draw a straight line from this corner to here. And on the other side, do the same thing up here. So we see different geometry with this new theory than we had for the Coulomb Moore theory. It allows a little bit more room uh, for success than the Coulomb Moore theory does. So it's less conservative than Coulomb Moore, uh, but still fairly conservative, uh, especially in this region. And so that theory is going to be called the modified Moore theory, and pretty good theory. And let's and so basically we will have multiple regions. If we're in the positive positive region, then this right hand boundary is our failure boundary. 
if we're in the positive negative region but the slope of our load line is imagine this 45 degree line going to here if our point is above that 45 degree line in this region then this is our boundary if our load line slope or if our operating point is below this 45 degree line right here if we're below that down here somewhere then this line becomes our failure boundary this line is a blending of our ultimate tension and ultimate compression so we use ultimate tension in two, re two partial regions we use a blending in a third region and then we use ultimate compression only in the final region we'll have to look at how that's stated okay first of all the brittle coulomb more i think we can get most of that on there uh, the brittle coulomb more has three regions both positive positive negative 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 brittle coulomb more both positive is a square both ne uh, one positive one negative is this dotted line both negative is our ultimate uh, tensile in compression. Our three cases, and in our positive positive case, only the rightmost boundary matters. In our all compressive case, only the bottom boundary matters. In the blended case, both A and B, ultimate tensile and ultimate compressive, matter. Notice they have now divided ultimate tensile by factor of safety. Should have done that earlier part of the chapter as well, but they didn't. Modified more. Be careful in reading this uh, set of equations, but they are still very simple. Okay, and I would put the word R right here in big letters. O R. Okay, this says if sigma A and B are both positive, then use this equation. Or if one's positive, one's negative, but our slope of the B over A line um, is greater than 1, okay, uh, sorry, sorry, I jumped. If this is true or this is true, use this simple statement. So put the word R right here, okay, so if they're both positive, use this. If one's positive, one's negative, but my slope is low, less than 1 my slope meaning slope less than one meaning the slope angle less than 45 degrees we'll go back and look at that then I'm still going to use just the ultimate tensile boundary if my um, if I'm in pure compression both a and B are compressive then I've got a very simple case as well the only remaining case is if one's positive a is positive B is in compression or negative and the slope of my load line has exceeded a slope of one or a slope angle of 45 degrees then I use the blended formula looking back at the picture for modified more both positive use the ultimate tensile stress boundary where my mouse is right now a is positive B is negative but my slope of my load line is less than 45 degrees because my load line is not passing through that point that's the 45 degree load line so up in this region I'm still gonna bump up against the right hand boundary only when I go below this 45 degree diagonal line into this region this triangular region below the 45 and this region when my operating points are below this 45 degree line inside that triangle then I use the blended boundary which blends together both the ultimate tensile and the ultimate compression and that's what these equations say for me so again I would get used to reading these equations do notice that they put in the uh, factors of safety now okay so uh, let me see I was asked to look at which examples let me go double check that See. Yes, example 5.5 and part E of problem 5.19 is what I've been asked to look at. So, example 5.5 says go back to the figure 5.3, 
uh, figure from example 5.3, it was this wrench that we saw in an earlier example. But now this wrench is going to made of, be made of cast iron. Okay. Um, let's see. What are we asked to find? Find the force by using either of these two failures. So since I don't know the force, I can't calculate stresses. Okay, but by knowing force, I can draw some load lines. We'll see if I actually put it together that way in just a moment. Now, noticing this force, this force will cause bending in this arm uh, of a moderately small amount, well, a medium amount, but it's also going to cause bending of this arm uh, through an amount, this says 12, combined with about another 2, a distance about 14 as compared to 15, which means the bending here is probably going to be a little bit greater, but in addition to bending, at this point I have significant torsion, and it is quite clear to me that when you put together both the bending and the torsion stresses in a uh, more circle way or a distortion energy way or for a brittle material using our failure theories, this is going to be the failure part that has both bending and torsion that I'm going to have to deal with. So we are assuming that this lever is strong enough and it's not part of the problem. We have a grade 30 cast iron and it is brittle. Okay, and since it's brittle, stress concentration factors are going to be set to 1. Why? Because we said for brittle materials uh, or for uh, cast iron. Uh, it has such stress concentrations built into the material itself that its properties take care of the stress concentrations. If we had other brittle materials, not cast iron, then we would indeed have to bring in our stress concentration factors. Okay, so we have an ultimate tensile strength of 31 and a compressive of 109. And so we need to go ahead and write our stress formulas and see what that says in light of our failure theories and these material properties. Did it say anything about a factor of safety? Haven't seen that yet. It might have been in the other problem. So, our nominal stresses were going to be a bending stress, MC over I, that, ca that stress concentration set to 1. Okay, and I don't know F, but my sigma X is 142.6 times F. And then I've got a tau XY, which is a TR over J calculation. And we're going to set this stress concentration equal to 1. And our shear stress comes out to be 76.4, our torsional stress. Uh, now, that's our sigma X and Y, but that doesn't give us our sigma A and B. We need to go to more circle to compute sigma A and B. And our sigma A and B will come as circle center which is the average of the two normal stresses, but our normal stress uh, in the other plane is zero, plus or minus the radius of the Mohr circle, which is the difference between our two normal stresses divided by two squared plus our torsional stress squared, coming up with a 175.8 and a minus 33.2, and this would be our sigma A, and this would be our sigma B, Notice sigma A is positive, sigma B is negative. That's going to place us potentially in that blended region. I say potential, it depends on the method we're going to use. But do notice my sigma A is quite large and my sigma B is fairly small. So that will have an impact, especially on the modified more as to which region I'm in. Okay, and so going back to our figure. Um, these numbers on this scale are wrong, but I'm going to have a large uh, positive uh, sigma A, but a small negative sigma B, which will place me on this dotted line if I'm going to use Coulomb more, but it's going to place me on this right hand line if I'm going to use modified more. Okay, so Brittle says I go back to equation 531B because I have sigma A positive, sigma B negative. And I'm going to use a factor of safety of 1. And I know my sigma A is a function of F. My sigma B is a function of F. I know these two numbers. Okay. The interesting question that you want to be careful with is for this ultimate compressive stress, do I put in a positive number or a negative number? The answer is I put in, a, to this formula, a positive number. Notice here, positive number, 
positive number is the way this thing is used with factor of safety equal one which together gives me an equation involving only one unknown and that is F and solving for F gives 167 pounds now interesting question uh, Coulomb Moore says I can apply 167 pounds to this thing what is modified more likely to say a greater or lesser and if you look at this failure diagram Coulomb Moore is very conservative it's going to limit what I can do the modified more is going to be more generous to me and tell me that I can apply greater forces before I reach the failure boundary so I expect the number that comes out of modified more to be larger than the 167 that I just got okay so for the modified more the slope of my load line is Sigma B over Sigma A magnitude that's the smallest 33.2 divided by the large 175.8 which is only a 1.189 slope which is clearly less than one so I am above the 45 degree line that would be implied here which means I only use the right hand boundary as my determinant of uh, failure or not so this thing says going back to the modified Moore equation it says Sigma A is ultimate tensile stress over factor of safety in this case is one if A and B are both positive not true in my case or if A is positive, B is negative, but my slope less than 1, which is true in this case. So I turn to this formula, and this formula says <coughs> that sigma A over ultimate tensile must equal 1, and I get 176 pounds of permissible force to apply to this part before failure occurs. And notice the modified Moore theory is less conservative, more generous. The uh, Coulomb Moore, brittle Coulomb Moore theory is more conservative and a little bit less generous okay so our failure of brittle materials we've already been through all of this which one do we use now let's see what did I mean when I said this I disagree with the simplicity statement above productive material behavior the preferred criteria is the distortion energy theory although some designers also apply the maximum shear stress theory because of its simplicity you know I ha I just have trouble believing there's anything easier than a one equation one unknown problem with no if statements so I actually think the modified uh, the uh, von Mises or distortion energy theory is quite simple okay given that I don't have the possibility of making a bad decision on which equation to use I'm just not gonna make that mistake so I tend to think it's even simpler uh, but it is true that uh, the maximum shear stress is conservative I just disagree with the simplicity and I think in the end you probably will as well okay so a simple little computer flowchart looking thing for decision making okay so I come in and if I have brittle behavior then I'm gonna move to the left side of the chart if I have ductile behavior I'm gonna move to the right side of the chart okay then I face the question, or do I have different yield and uh, tension and compressive stresses? If that's the case, the only theory, uh, let's see, are, are they equal? If yes, I have two options. If they are not equal, I only have one option, and that's the ductile Coulomb Moore theory, which in fact looks no different than the brittle Coulomb theor Moore theory. Okay? If I do have the same uh, yield and tension and compression, then I have two choices. If I want to be ultra conservative, I'll go to the maximum shear stresses. If I want an easy choice that is probably a more realistic choice, but not conservative, then I would go to the distortion energy theory. And that would be the failure theories for static loading of both ductile and brittle materials. Dr. Hatami Barbini asked me to work problem 5-19e with you and so let's take a look at problem 5-19e it says we have a brittle material with properties of ultimate tensile strength of 30 kpsi and ultimate compressive strength is 90 kpsi using the brittle coulomb more and the modified more theories which are our only two theories for brittle materials determine the factor of safety for the following states of plane stress so now we're asked to compute the factor of safety and he asked me to look at part e with you where we have a stress state of sigma x equal minus 20 and sigma y equal minus 20 
And so if we were to draw our stress square for plane stress, we would have a minus 20 pointing on the horizontal face and the minus 20 pointing at the vertical faces. In addition to that, on each of the four faces, we would have a tau xy of minus 15 kpsi. And so, step number one for any problem like this is we'll take our stress state uh, in terms of known, oh, I'll take our stress state, which presumably has been calculated from loads, and I don't know what the loads are. We take our stress state and we form the two-dimensional Mohr circle formed from plane stress in this case. And so we go through that process first. And it's interesting to do that when we have both sigma x and sigma y being identical. That means our, and our two points to be plotted are both going to be on a vertical line at sigma equal minus 20 kpsi. The only thing that distinguishes the two points that we plot first on the circle is one will be at a positive shear stress and one of the two points will be at a negative shear stress. And we won't be able to tell the two points apart. And so we'll have an interesting start to the more circle line, but just inferring from what I've already said, of course, the radius of the more circle is going to be this 15. Okay, since the sigma x and the sigma y are plotted at exactly the same point, we'll have points at x equal minus 20, y equal minus 15, and we'll have a point at x equal minus 20, y equal positive 15. A circle centered at x equal minus 20 having a radius of 15. Well, that more circle in my head, we'll look at the numbers in just a second, but that more circle in my head says the circle center at minus 20, going plus or minus 15, will take us to a minus 5 and a minus 35. Let's go look at the numbers. Uh, wrong ones, I'll find them, hang on a second. That's not it, it's here somewhere. Because I do in fact have the solution handy. Where did it go? Let's move, ah, here, yeah, this is it, sorry. Okay, so to get sigma A and sigma B from sigma X, Y, and our tau, sigma X and Y were both minus 20, so that's a minus 20 plus minus 20 over 2. The average of the two is the center, and that'll give us a minus 20. The circle radius is the difference between, and so this is really a minus 20 minus a negative 20. Okay, and so that this quantity comes about, out to be a 0, and so the radius of the circle is the 15, and so our sigma A and sigma B are in fact, as I said a moment ago, a minus 5 and a minus 35. A would be the rightmost point, B would be the leftmost point. Now that we know that, we now want to go back into the rules for the two methods, find out which case we're in, and then do the computation. Now, remembering the picture, what we have here is both our Coulomb Moore and modified Moore for brittle materials and we are in the negative negative situation we are down here this will be one of the pr easiest problems you'll ever encounter using these two methods because in each each of the two methods we're in case one now i'm sorry we're in case three where they're both negative so looking at the brittle coulomb more equations um, both sigma a and sigma b are less than zero or negative and so we will take our sigma B, which is the leftmost one of those, that's our minus 35, and we'll set that equal to negative of our ultimate in compression, and we'll solve for that factor of safety. How will modified more be different? In modified more, again, we are at sigma A and B both negative. If we compare the two equations, they are absolutely identical equations, and so we get absolutely identical answers between the two methods moving this out of the way back to the solution now that we know our sigma a is minus 5 and sigma b is minus 35 they're both negative then rearranging our brittle coulomb more equation to solve for factor of safety we get minus our ultimate compressive divided by sigma b and that gives us a 2.57 factor of safety the 90 over the 35 and 
we had the exact same question for the modified more, so we don't expect anything different, and we get a factor of safety of 2.57. Should we have had different signs on A and B? Then, of course, we would have gone to one of the different cases, and still we would have known our A and B stresses, we would have known our ultimate tension and compressive, and this would have been a one equation, one unknown problem to solve for the factor of safety.